That's it. Hi, everyone. Uh, I won't take too long because the dinner is approaching. So um, this talk is going to be on deserialization bug. So if you are a pen tester, this, will, this talk will give you uh, a good trick that will probably be able to reuse this year, at least. And if you're a sysadmin, this will uh, expose you a problem that is uh, uh, getting more popular. And, uh, and uh, so yeah, so it's a practical talk, but a technical one. So who am I? Before starting the talk, I'm a researcher at GoSecker. So basically, I'm doing uh, analyzing vulnerabilities and trying to find new ones on a popular uh, uh, software. I'm also doing uh, various tools to help pen tester and uh, other uh, security analysts. Uh, some of the tools I do, I do find security bug, as uh, Pierre David mentioned. So it's a static analysis tool. I also do one for .NET and other uh, burp extension for uh, helping pen test, uh, pen test task. I'm a volunteer at, uh, for NerdSec uh, for a few years. I'm doing challenges. And uh, it's the second time I'm giving a conference here. So now getting into the subject. So why we are here. So what do all these uh, applications have in common? So late at the uh, last year, all those uh, applications were vulnerable to the same uh, vulnerability class. So it, it's the same pattern, not exactly the same exploitation, but it's really the same uh, vulnerability class. And uh, all those are Java application. But uh, we'll see, uh, I'll try to highlight also the design principle and the design problem related to this flaw that also apply to other language and other uh, library. So the common uh, thing is that they all use ser serialization uh, uh, functionality that are accessible remotely. So uh, I will divide this talk. So first, we're going to go to the basic. So just explain what is the serialization to make sure you understand uh, how serialization is used uh, properly. So what's the real use case? Then we'll go into exploitation scenario to see uh, how we can uh, use uh, alternate behavior and unexpected, unexpected behavior based on this functionality. Uh, I'll also give example of other language just to show that there are small differences, but it's same principle uh, that will apply. So what is the serialization? So uh, I'll give a basic overview. So first, what is serialization? It's when you transform data and you put it in a format that is ready to be transferred or stored. So uh, why do we do this? We do this transformation either to persist a state, so for example, to do storage of a, a, a state of the application, a session, or anything. Uh, we can do caching with serialization. Uh, also, pr uh, pr communication between process, if we need to restore something in another process. And uh, what will be the most interesting case will be network communication, because if we're talking about client-server communication, that's uh, much, much more potential for security uh, for pen tester to get remote code execution than when it's all local communication. So that will be the main uh, focus of our different attack. So as does serialization uh, work? I have a visual representation. So we have one application running. In this case, it's a client application. We have various objects in memory. And uh, we cannot just copy uh, the memory representation because uh, object will have tons of reference of caching property that we don't necessarily need to transfer. That's why we're doing a transformation and we'll extract some of the field potentially. So then we will create, a, we'll serialize to an object, so it will be a, a format. So here we're going to talk about native serialization, but uh, it's same as uh, JSON, XML, uh, protobuf, bencode. All those are, can be considered serialization uh, format, but they will have difference, obviously, in their representation. And when the other application will receive this format, it will be able to restore this state and reconstruct the object out of it. So I have listed a couple of uh, formats, but what's the main difference between uh, native serialization in Java and, for example, JSON? So the main difference is that 
uh, Java native serialization, you can add custom behavior to uh, objects that are being deserialized. Uh, in JSON, it's uh, static and info, so you can list property, but you cannot uh, add custom behavior when deserialization occurs, at least not in the uh, most popular uh, libs. So I have a couple of examples. Just to give you an example, so here, optionally, for serializable object, we can, uh, in Java, uh, create a read object method, and this read object method will be called when the object gets deserialized. So if it's a communication over a network, when the server will receive the object, if it's a custom uh, serializable object with a read object, this will be executed when it's deserialized. I have another example here that is doing other thing. But in general, it can be more complex calling other classes. These are really basic uh, example. And uh, one thing to uh, remember is, from a design point of view, uh, from a security perspective, I mean, uh, as soon as you have custom behavior that library are uh, introducing, uh, for the attacker, it's uh, uh, an additional entry point. So. Uh, Contrary to static data for, like JSON, if I know that I can uh, instantiate any class uh, on, of your application and trigger those read objects, maybe I will be able to uh, instantiate class that are not expected to be called. So then those read object uh, behavior could be triggered in, uh, in an unexpected uh, way. And one thing to mention, um, like in the example on the left, the Object state will be restored, so the property will be uh, filled, and then some execution will occur. So then the attacker has a, an interesting entry point because he'll be able to initialize the object as he wants, and then the uh, behavior will be executed. So this introduces much more uh, possibilities. So uh, in the code, we'll see uh, just an, an example uh, of Java deserialization. So if the server receive a, a payload, it will do read object to deserialize the object. So internally, what it will do, in the byte stream, uh, it will find the class name. Based on this, it will load the class if it's not already loaded. It will instantiate a class. And no constructor is called, so by default, no method is called. And it's only if read object method are uh, implement that they will be called. And the common cast that we see this is not something that happened prior uh, those steps. So the ex execution of the read object method will happen even if the object in a, is not a comment. So it will trigger, in the end, a cast exception. But this is, does not stop an attacker from sending any uh, type that is available uh, in the application. So the, there are no assertion that, in this case, comment object will be sent to the uh, server. It can be any object. So. We'll look at uh, one example that was uh, the most uh, common one to the, the application we mentioned previously. So we'll look at common collection. So we need two ingredients to have uh, a vulnerable, uh, two ingredients to have a vulnerable application. First, we need deserialization. If you're not doing deserialization, your application is not vulnerable for sure. So if you have property appli proprietary application, I'm going to show you. In the end, a, a tool that will be able to scan your application and find if you're using this organization somewhere in your application, potentially in legacy uh, functionality. And the other ingredient, ingredient that is needed to have a successful exploitation is have par for ser serializable class. And those ser serializable class, we'll call them gadget. These are uh, class that are serializable with interesting read object method. And when trig, we can uh, do uh, unexpected behavior that will lead to uh, remote code execution. So the main design flaw is you shouldn't do the serialization and accept any class, any type of object on your class path, because you'll have so many libraries that you don't have looked at that could uh, uh, create a bad behavior. So this is one of the popular gadgets that uh, all the application I mentioned prior add in their class path. So 
those are uh, classed on the right from a, a lib common collection from Apache. And uh, I won't go into the detail of how, how the gadget works because I want to stay high level to just to make sure you understand the design principle that is uh, the, the design flow. But in the end, those class uh, can lead to uh, uh, remote code execution. And the interesting to, to, uh, to notice is that uh, some of the class, the chain transformer, are not uh, classed with the read object method. And the way they are triggered is that they are, uh, we're using an invocation handler. And invocation handler is serializable object that uh, is another entry point. So it's not only uh, serializable uh, class that are interesting to attack. Because invocation handler in uh, Java is going to be a combination of uh, invocation handler and a proxy. So the way it works, it's like in script. So if you want to do mocking on object, you can uh, replace, if you, uh, instead of calling class test, you could mock uh, a class that will likely implement test, but instead all, all the call will be redirected to a, a proxy, uh, at, uh, the deposit to an, an invocation handler. So the idea is that proxy are serializable, so in your gadget you will put an instance of a proxy, and it will reference to an invocation handler that will you'll be your interesting entry point. So all invocation handler in the class path uh, of your application can be uh, triggered by an attacker. And it was the case of comment collection. Uh, they were using uh, an invocation handler from uh, the GDK, but in the end it was calling uh, comment collection classes. So I will do a demo of uh, a tool that you could use in a pen test that is uh, wrapping tons of, of gadgets so you, do, you don't have to build yourself uh, all the chain of, uh, that I present previously. Okay, so this demo, I, I've chosen JBoss because uh, visually it's uh, more uh, easy to understand because uh, most of the vulnerable software were available over a uh, remote admin client, so it was all command line uh, client, but this one, it's over HTTP, so it will be more visual and easier to understand. So we have uh, all the version of JBoss here, and the interesting uh, endpoint is uh, Invoker, I will just zoom a bit. At this URL, invoker, JMX, invoker servlet, and this endpoint receives a serialized object. So if we're using the application or the admin panel and we see serialized object in the in Burr proxy, for example, then we know we have a potential to uh, replace those serialized object with our malicious gadget. And that's what we'll just do. So I'll just zoom out. So, the tool I'll be demoing is a uh, YSO serial. So, I think it's visible. So, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, when you enter no argument, it will list you all the gadget available. So, the idea is that gadget will only work if the needed classes are on the class path. So, if, for example, you have the common collection library on the class path of the vulnerable application, it will work. But if it's not the case, you might need to rely on another variation. And uh, the arguments are quite easy to, uh, to set up. So the first argument will be the, uh, the payload. Uh, so in this case, we'll use a command collection one. And the second argument will be uh, the command will execute. So in this case, I'll just uh, run calculator, but uh, you could replace this to uh, some duplicate to our reverse shell and then execute it for uh, rehaving a reverse shell on uh, the server. So I'll just do this. Flip. 
So the output will be a serialized object. We can, uh, if needed, we can encode it into base64. The output is just the payload. So, but in our case, we'll uh, just send, save it to a file, to nordsec.bin. Just, just to show back the command. So the only two arguments were needed was the which gadget we're going to use and then the command being executed. So this, you replace this with your reverse shell. And uh, where I'm saving it to nordsec.bin. So on the left, I have burp. Uh, in repeater, so I will be sending an HTTP request to the vulnerable endpoint. And if I send nothing, I will get uh, this serialization uh, error, telling me the empty uh, value, I get uh, an error. Instead, I will load from uh, the file I've just saved, the nordsec.bin. And this is the serialized uh, gadget. So, and as soon as I will send it, then I get execution because uh, my server is running on the same uh, machine. So this is just a visual confirmation. And the, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's actually a really writable exploit. So uh, if you see in your assessment, all vulnerable, uh, all the GBus, uh, WebSphere, all those uh, Java container, a lot of them add a remote uh, API like this. So that's, uh, so that's for identifying, uh, exploiting actually uh, with gadget, uh, those uh, vulnerable services. So the basic methodology is you need to first find serialized object going through uh, your proxy. Sometimes it will be in Wireshark if it's uh, not HTTP request. Uh, first, then, uh, the, I mean, the second step will be to generate uh, a gadget. Uh, so, um, in this case, with YSOCL, we will able to generate one for command collection. Then we replace the initial object by it, and then we just replay the, the request or continue the, uh, with the protocol. Uh, if it doesn't work, you can re repeat the same thing with different gadgets. So, it just trial and error. Since you're, if you're doing a black box test, you won't know uh, for sure what are available classes on the remote application, but you can just try one after the other. Uh, if it doesn't work, uh, it might be a specific protocol. Sometimes if the uh, read ends or other primitive type prior reading the object, you'll need to just follow the sequence of the protocol until a read object is done, and you'll be able to do uh, the same thing. So that's a little detail. And uh, if it doesn't work, it might be that it's not vulnerable, so it, they are whitelisting the class that could be deserialized, or there could be a blacklist uh, in place. So that's the demo I just did. So that's from an attacker point of view, or if you're doing pen test, that's what you would do, uh, black box. But what if you have a proper, proprietary application in Java, for example, and you want to know, am I vulnerable to that, this? And uh, because you could have so many endpoints, sometimes you don't remember the legacy one. Uh, so uh, to, I'll do, give, do an, an example of how you can scan uh, your application or even property, proprietary uh, application that you don't have the source code from. So what you'll look for is two things, the two ingredients I mentioned prior. So the deserialization operation, so this is the design flow. And uh, potentially the gadget to exploit. So if you have, if you are testing an application and you are able to download a trial or download the application, you could do a scanning and potentially find the interesting endpoint that are uh, exposed that do this serialization. So this will uh, give you some hints. And also if the gadget are not uh, part of the known, you might need to build a custom uh, payload for, from this. So, So the demo I'll do is with the uh, find security bugs. This is the static analysis tool I'm maintaining. So in this case, I'll just uh, analyze the same application as uh, previously. So 
In this case, it will be GBoss. But uh, if you have a, an application, you could do the same thing. So uh, find security box, the command line, how it work, you specify uh, directly a jar. But if you want to scan completely uh, all your, your application, you could uh, extract all the list of jar and then pass it to the, uh, uh, the tool, and it will scan everything. So in this case, uh, GBoss, it's around uh, 2,000 meg of binary uh, jar file. So uh, what I've done, I've created a, a list that contains all the jar, and I will uh, pass this, uh, the content of this file to the tool. So the command just looks like this. Oops. Okay, so the command is in, in detail is not that interesting, but I will be analyzing all the jar of the GBoss, and I will be uh, creating a report out of it. So this could take a couple of minutes, so I have already a report produced. And uh, one little detail to mention is that I don't have the source code of uh, GBoss right now, so it's only scanning the binary format. So this is interesting because you'll have a full coverage of uh, the class available and uh, you'll be able to reproduce this on a proprietary application also. So I'll let this scan, but I have already the, the result. So we're looking for two type of thing. First, the deserialization uh, part. So as an attacker, if you're uh, looking at a big application, you want to know where in the application deserialization occur. So you have, uh, you'll have obviously a couple of false positive because as I mentioned previously, Serialization is used for multiple uh, use case, and it's not always uh, uh, remotely accessible. But here in uh, JBoss, we can quickly see by the package name that uh, we'll find uh, some uh, remoting packages. So this is a remoting API, so most likely uh, accessible from uh, remote. And other uh, uh, RESTEasy is also something uh, accessible uh, for REST API. So could have a potential. So we could analyze those. We have a reference to uh, in which method and in which class the deserialization occurs. So we can review uh, with a disassembler or decompiler. Now that we know that it's uh, vulnerable to deserialization, we need to find gadgets. So we could try the gadget from a YSO serial. But uh, if we didn't we have a known one that, that work. Uh, uh, in the next version of Find Security Bugs, there will be a, a gadget finder for, uh, based on uh, multiple heuristics. So basically, we don't want to list all the serializable class in the, the application because there would be a, a couple of thousand, possi possibly. So those are all uh, case where uh, this serialization is a serializable class with uh, a risky op operation being done, so sometimes reflection or uh, other uh, behavior. Also, invocation handler are also identified as a variant of those. And the third uh, occurrence that it will find is actually the vulnerable uh, gadget that was found in a common collection. So with this tool, if you're, you want to do research and find your own gadget, if you're stuck because, uh, some, uh, because currently uh, library are proactively uh, patching those, so they add switch to make them not uh, serializable remotely, or uh, add, add switch. Uh, so the gadgets are still there, but not exploitable. Uh, so we need to find new ones. So if you want to find new ones, that's uh, one way that you could help you, because it will highlight you some uh, interesting uh, class instead of looking at all the code uh, of uh, all the library in your application. So that's from a defense perspective. If you have a... Uh, uh, you're maintaining a web application in Java, you could use also the plugin in your ID uh, to do the, the scanning also. And uh, I'll quickly go to the other language. So that's just to, to highlight that uh, this is a design flow that applies to multiple type of libraries. So it's not just native uh, serialization in Java. As soon as you see custom feature that occur uh, during parsing, 
Yeah, it, it, uh, it's something that we have saw also on other libraries in other languages that they decide to add custom behavior that could be triggered by inserting a specific keyword or specific uh, part in XML, for example. So any library that has custom behavior to deserialization will could lead potentially to unexpected uh, behavior and uh, remote code execution potentially. So we'll look at the PHP uh, case. So PHP unserialize method, uh, there's no possibility to whitelist the class that you want to unserialize. So really, if you are doing unserialized PHP, which is uh, you should never do, uh, you're open to all the class that are loaded uh, from your file. So anything that you have include will be accessible and will be able to be deserialized. This will include, obviously, also all the class of uh, PHP API. And the interesting trigger here, there's no read method like in Java, but all the magic method can be triggered uh, uh, accidentally. That means that if you're deserializing an object that an attacker sends, it will also call the destruct method uh, when the, the script will finish execute. So then you could have also a chain of execution that would lead to uh, remote code execution. Uh, in general, the, the chain will be uh, quite complex. Uh, it will be a chain across uh, multiple objects. But here I have a, a small uh, example that is uh, easier to understand. So this is taken from ACLU CTF. And the challenge was, uh, the, oops, there was an unserialized operation that was being done. And you add also sort of access to source code. So you add a couple of uh, PHP files also with the application. And what, one of the class, SQLDB, was having a uh, deconstruct method, a destruct method. And uh, each time the SQLDB uh, was being closed, it was calling SQL close and then create log. And the create log was doing uh, uh, SQL queries. So for, from the developer perspective, it didn't intend that this method would be called remotely. It's all uh, variable uh, coming from the local object. But the attacker, uh, this class become an endpoint because uh, I can call the destruct method with any state that I want of this object. So any field, I can uh, put it in the state that I want. So in this case, the interesting part was the create log operation. And it was doing a SQL query uh, with sanitization. But um, sanitization, what it will do, it will, uh, it will, if you add a single code, it will add a backslash and the proper escaping. But here the thing to notice is that uh, the log table, the table, is not between codes. And uh, in this case, we don't need to, to add code, so we'll be able to do just a straight uh, injection. So the way the, ga the gadget or the malicious payload will work is you serialize this class with uh, the malicious value log table. And once it will execute, it will trigger the uh, SQL injection. So that's for the example uh, in PHP. In uh, Python, it's uh, also a, a bit different. There's a pickle, which is uh, highly documented that you shouldn't use in remote API. But uh, you'll find it uh, not that often, but more often in CTF. And the interesting part is the reduce method. So like the read object uh, method in Java, you can specify a custom reduce method. And it, this uh, method will be called uh, one so object are deserialized. And the main difference with Java is that you're not dealing with all the objects. You can also even serialize this method uh, in the object that you want. So you can also serialize a uh, code, uh, code section with the object. So here we have a basic uh, example, so called puck, uh, calling call.exe. And uh, the remote application doesn't even need to have this uh, class in, uh, in its application. We'll uh, serialize this class. And the reduce method, as we can see, is doing the code that we want to, to execute. So in this case, it's uh, creating a process. And uh, in the X dump or the serialized version, we can see that the code of the reduce method is also bundled. So this is uh, probably the, the most uh, easy way to, to exploit a serialization because we don't need to. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, potentially, uh, we, but yeah, yeah. But then you will need to to use another API that is uh, available. Uh, yeah, that's something I'm not sure, but uh, I will have to check. So the, the main difference to remember is that in the case of pickle, uh, the reduce method, the code is serialized with the object, so it's not just a property and a data. So solution, the, instead of uh, doing patch and doing whitelist, uh, so for existing application, uh, if you have a legacy Java application that are doing serialization, you could add a blacklist to make, make, reduce the risk of uh, having known gadget being uh, used as an exploitation vector. For a new application, you should sim simply choose a library that are not doing fancy behavior on this serialization. So using JSON, uh, protobuf, if you need a compact uh, protocol. So uh, that's something to, to remember at design, because afterward, it will bite you, as you have more pro a problem to maintain it and patch uh, for the different gadget. Uh, one of the projects you can use uh, out of the box for Java is not so serial. It will uh, blacklist by default all the known gadget, but it's just a guacamole game until uh, so, so, uh, somebody finds another uh, gadget. So that's it. Uh, I'm done with my talk and my demo, so if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate uh, to ask them now or afterward. <laughs>